forum about preserving State Street. I'm Ellen McCulloch Lowell, and it will be my pleasure to moderate uh, this presentation and the discussion afterwards. We're very glad to host this dynamic subject at beautiful Christ Church, which is itself a 150-year-old landmark on State Street. We think of Christ Church as both a sacred space and a community resource. I want to recognize and also thank Paul Habersang, our priest in partnership. Paul, so everybody can see you. Thank you. I also want to thank all the speakers in advance and our co-organizer, Linda Prescott. Um, it's wonderful to know that we have so much knowledge in this room. We have people from the city, the business sector, the Vermont Historical Society, the Division for Historic Preservation, the Montpelier Historic Preservation Commission, which is a city-appointed body, the Montpelier Heritage Group, Sustainable Montpelier, the Montpelier Development Co Corporation, and many active citizens and artists, and many of you represent many of those roles. <laughs> so, and it's also very good to have Orca here to record our proceedings, so more people will be able to, to listen and learn. I expect this time together will be both an education and also enlightening to many of us. We'll learn about our historic State Street, what it used to look like, what is its status now, how do we want to experience this key part of our cityscape. You will hear briefly about what's challenging this historic building, Christ Church. We'll learn about the revitalization of the Montpelier Heritage Group. And we'll discuss what we've learned, hear your perspectives about what characterizes State Street. How do we envision its future? So to start us off, I'd like to first call on Jamie Duggan who works for the Division for Historic Preservation and tonight represents the Montpelier Historic Preservation Commission to give us a brief overview. Jamie? Thanks. Good evening. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming out. I uh, really appreciate uh, the attendance here this evening and just wanted to give a brief overview and let you know a little bit about uh, some of the work that our commission's been doing. As Alan mentioned, we're uh, appointed by the City Council, and uh, the Historic Preservation Commission is a CLG program, which is a partnership between the National Park Service and the Division for Historic Preservation. And it is a program that um, helps communities that take uh, historic preservation into consideration of their local uh, zoning ordinance and provides funding and other uh, support to help with those endeavors. And so our, our district, when it was created, the uh, historic district, when it was first surveyed and evaluated back in the 70s, um, ended up having about 85% of the structures within the boundaries contributing to the significance of the historic district. Um, we had a really early uh, local design review ordinance, in effect. Uh, that was supported by a document called Cityscape, which um, was written by uh, architect Bob Burley over in Wakefield and who did a lot of work here in Montpelier and uh, in the Capitol Complex. Uh, Capital Complex. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, because of the strength of these materials, over that time we've been able to really preserve that same level of integrity uh, to our historic district. The Historic Preservation Commission uh, started back in uh, a project in 2010 some fits and bursts. So we ended up completing it in 2016, which was an update of the historic district. Uh, Resurveying all the properties, some properties were taken out, they had either been already demolished or had lost their integrity. Other uh, properties were added in, a few extra that had come of age now over 50 years uh, that were not uh, at that threshold back when it was originally done. Some analysis that was done at that time though told us that we retained 86% still of the buildings within the historic district are contributing to the, um, the integrity of the district. And that's a really important thing. Um, we've heard lately with the zoning changes some uh, frustrations with design review 
in some capacities. And so one of the next projects that we've done, um, and a lot of this really led by our chair, Eric Gilbertson here, um, is looking at the design review regulations. And uh, we met just last night with the design review committee, the other, uh, another city board that uh, takes on and uh, really uh, executes that policy. Just some good feedback there. We're getting ready to go to the planning commission and have a discussion with them and hope to integrate these regulations into the new zoning ordinance. Um, this is important now because uh, we are on the cusp of some of the most concentrated development in the historic district that we've seen volume-wise and in intensity in a long time. And uh, there's a lot of positive uh, things that can come out of that. And our goal uh, from the Historic Preservation Commission's perspective is to make sure that that's done in a way that is balanced and allows for growth but still preserves the character and integrity of the Montpelier Historic District, which um, is quite valuable and significant part of our, our local culture here. So um, that's just sort of uh, one of the updates of what we had. We do have some work to do after that. We're looking to uh, provide some design guidelines to help folks get through um, the, the, the design review process. Uh, but what our goal with that has been is to make it a bit more predictable, uh, allow for some uh, greater uh, administrative um, approval so folks don't have to come to lots of different meetings, design review committee, development review board, whatnot. Uh, and so um, I would point, like to point you to our uh, website, our web page. Uh, there's some information there. Uh, keep checking back and review it, and we'd love to get your feedback and comments. Please feel free to direct any of your thoughts related to that to our commission, uh, to myself, uh, Chair Eric Gilbertson. Uh, Bob McCullough has uh, recently joined us as a member, Judith Ehrlich, uh, Elizabeth Peebles, and Jenna Lapachinsky. Um, so those are folks that you can reach out and get some information about that. Thank you very much, and um, appreciate your participation. Thank you, David. Thanks so much for explaining a little bit about how that all works. And I know you're really sincere about asking for <coughs> feedback, too. So I hope people will get back to you, especially after we hear more today. Um, now I'd like to introduce David Sheets, my former colleague at the Vermont Arts Council, who has served at state, as State House Curator now for 33 years and has done so much to enrich our heritage. David, I think. One of my most memorable images of the decade will be you watching the Statue of Ceres take <laughs> off to her home on top of the State House. Thank you for all you've done and for your great knowledge about this part of Montpelier. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's great to have a lovely crowd like this on an inclement evening like that outside. And we're going to keep this uh, as brief as possible. That's why Helen uh, mentioned the time limits for each of the speakers tonight. And uh, she was uh, especially uh, training her sights on me because she knows that I have all these fantastic images of Montpelier that you're going to want to see, but since there are 19 of them, and I have been given 15 minutes. Oh, I have 20. Oh, okay. So that's about a minute per image. Okay, good, good, good. This, is, this will make it a little easier to achieve. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to do, frankly, is open it up to the crowd because we have resources in this group, um, not just onlookers. I see so many people here who know a lot about Montpelier's past, and I hope you'll chime in as we look at these images together to get a sense of what historic State Street was like particularly back in the 19th century when it really took shape. Um, the big event in the development of State Street, of course, started with the State House. And the original State House 
Excuse me, a little too loud. Pardon me? Too loud. Too loud. Too loud. Okay. Sorry. Um, the microphone will be right. Okay. Is it better now? Okay. Um, that um, big event, the State House, uh, and I'm not referring to the first State House, which dates back to 1808, but rather the second State House, completed in 1838. And that structure caused them to widen State Street and to begin to build structures um, that were uh, commensurate with that stately building um, that was located, unlike its predecessor, not right down on the street, but perched up on the hillside where they blasted away at the rock to create that building site that has served the State House so well, uh, particularly during times of flood, uh, which occasionally Montpelier suffers from, as we all know. So, um, this is our image for the show. I'm just going to advance the slides and we'll start to talk. Okay. There we go. Oops. Too fast. So we start with an earl a fairly early image. This um, and I want to thank first of all Paul Carnahan, who just came in, um, the longtime librarian of the Vermont Historical Society. Paul's it all started uh, when I wanted to put together a few slides with naturally his book. And I hope you all earn, you own copies of Paul's book, um, available in bookstores around the town still to this day, I believe. At least you'll find a copy at the State House. So um, this is the early Pavilion Hotel, which as many of you may know, was developed at the very time that the State House was built in Montpelier. Um, the enterprising uh, son of Colonel Jacob Davis, Thomas Davis, um, built this hotel um, adjacent to the State House. He knew what he was doing when he donated the land for the State House right next door. And he knew that there was a ready market for a hotel such as this. And this is the original structure that stayed there until the 1870s when it was replaced with the more, with the pavilion hotel that some people in the community still remember. Um, but I want uh, to point out, it was on the exact same site. Um, there was a courthouse in the rear. This is St. Augustine's Catholic Church, the first St. Augustine's. And Right over here is what we can identify as maybe best known to the community still as the thrush. So this is the thrush on its original site lined up with the Pavilion Hotel and other structures uh, in the rear where the parking areas are today adjacent to the State House. But when this photograph was taken, I'm pretty confident the 1859 State House had been built. Um, opposite that view, so this is the same green that you were just looking at that is adjacent to the pavilion, which is in this direction. This is the first, uh, an early structure that was directly opposite the Pavilion Hotel, a Greek revival temple front uh, building, adjacent to Montpelier's first train station, which stood where the Chittenden Bank building now stands, um, although uh, a little further back. God, I'm having trouble looking at the here we go. Sorry. I'm not sure. 
Mr. Bryant. So this is the Montpelier House, which was the hotel that stood on the site of today's Capitol Plaza and, uh, and its predecessor, the Tavern. Um, so this is an early hotel called the Montpelier House. And the brick house over here, a federal style brick house, um, was the home of the Wood Art Gallery. So the Wood Art Gallery was housed in that beginning in the late 1890s, so it was a residence and a business place prior to that, but it would be best known to all of you as the Wood Art Gallery. It was demolished uh, sometime in the late 1940s. <laughs> okay. It's getting interesting here. Anybody know where on State Street we are at this point? Do you see any recognizable? Yes. So, exactly. The, the one big recognizable feature here is this big column, which is the portico of the Washington County Courthouse. So if you know that's the courthouse, then you know what State Street looks like going in this direction toward the pavilion. So the pavilion is somewhere lost in the trees here. Um, these two structures would ultimately be demolished to build a late 19th century post office that some people in the community still remember. The big rusticated granite uh, post office would have been built where this portico of uh, uh, Grecian building and the federal style house next to it. Actually, both of those buildings were moved. They weren't oh, they were moved? They were moved. So Steve the, the second one with the columns is now 28 East State Street. And the one... 28 State Street? They took the columns off the front and did another gable on the front. Oh. And the building... The no building portico the, anymore. The building between that one and the courthouse. No. Coming back. Coming back this way. <laughs> This. That, that building was moved up on to East State Street, and that East. you can see the 34 or 36 is an apartment building. It looks, it still looks that way. Right, so that's on East State Street. East State Street. Fabulous. I did not know this. Okay. So put them on logs and roll them up the hill with horses. And yeah, houses. yeah. So this has to predate the 1890s uh, post office that would have been built on this site. That's all we can say. So this was probably taken in the 1870s or 80s. Paul, would you say? 70s. 70s or 80s, maybe? Before the post office was built on that, on that side. Um, on opposite it, we can't see a lot about what's going on here, but we're getting into the, obviously, the Christ Church neighborhood um, and the buildings that flanked it. And now we can see a little more of that side of State Street um, with this uh, building, a hotel again. Um, another structure, is this Capitol Hall? Yes. So this is Capitol Hall. And then um, down further is the Montpelier House, the, the hotel standing where the tavern was. This is the federal style house that would become the Wood Art Gallery. Um, and you can see the buildings that still stand on State Street beyond the, the Capitol Plaza, 110 State Street, which was the original home of the Vermont Mutual Insurance Company, and beyond it, National Life Insurance Company, uh, built in 1890 as their first Home office in a in a self uh, in a standalone structure. Um, on the site again, 
where you can see those houses, some of these houses, because the post office has still not been built. But this is the courthouse again, the Washington County Courthouse, the very one we have today, although its clock tower was replaced with um, uh, one that is a little more elaborate around 1880 or so. This was the post office earlier, and this structure I know was saved and stands directly behind City Hall and the firehouse, uh, most recently known as the Puralisk. Um, and uh, um, anyway, a beautiful structure. The bank building uh, that stood where Elm Street is, um, gone. And there's that uh, magnificent post office that was built uh, circa 1890, um, right next to the same courthouse um, with that more splendid um, uh, new cupola on top. An excellent question. Why did they replace the post office? <laughs> and further up the street, of course, the Pavilion Hotel now has been built on the site of the earlier Pavilion Hotel. This is what it looked like initially before they would add another floor on top as a mansard roof. So the mansard roof um, expanded the pavilion in the 1880s, but in 18, 1876, this is what it looked like um, with its big verandas and, of course, the State House uh, beyond. The State House, with its uh, original uh, finishes on the dome, um, all made of wood, as you may know, and painted with sand paint in a gray color to give the drum of the dome a granite-like look, painting the copper red so that it would look like a Renaissance terracotta roof. And of course, the original statue of Ceres, right? When did For agriculture. When did it get gilded? It was gilded in 1906. So we know this uh, is somewhere in the 1870s before uh, the mansard roof was added to the pavilion. And right here is Vermont Mutual's headquarters, now a state office building. Um, this is on the site of the Chittenden Bank building, the second train station for Montpelier, with another impressive clock tower. Um, there's a magnificent photograph um, that you guys, I, I think, have showing a record, a wrecking ball, not so magnificent, uh, but violent, um, showing a wrecking ball taking this clock tower off as they demolished the train station back in the 1960s. And this is the rear of that train station. Um, where you can see the platform, the locomotive. Um, we still, this is all gone, of course, all this fanciful uh, Victorian uh, uh, splendor beyond. You can just see the parapet of the old National Life Building, which is currently the uh, Agency of Agriculture. And uh, you can also see the cupola on top of the baggage handling building, which also still stands. So this is still there, that is still there, but this is long gone. And there's the post office again, uh, all dressed up for Dewey Day, or 19, it could be the 1905 centennial of Montpelier as the capital. It's a little hard to tell. I know what the bunting looked like on the State House. I'm a little less certain of the bunting on other public buildings. 
And this is a great view because here you can see um, the Vermont Federal Building, is, for lack of a better term. Um, this is the brick house that still stands on State Street. This is where the Pavilion Hotel was, and right next to it, this is the Thrush. So this is before they moved the Thrush back from its original location, lined up with the Vermont Federal House, which still stands here. And happily, of course, the Thrush is still with us. And a wonderful photograph that Paul sent me of uh, downtown Montpelier, right at the junction of State and Main Streets. Um, obviously, some uh, road work going on here in the, in the middle of the action. But it just shows the incredible variety of architectural styles in the heart of the downtown of Montpelier. Um, all of these Italian facades, as, as well as other uh, earlier, this is a federal style building at the corner that uh, was essentially a, a very similar building to what we still have on this side of State Street. Um, how, how do we refer to that building? Um, I never know what to call it. Cool jewels, okay? So cool jewels is in the lower part of this brick building, and that's among the oldest surviving buildings in the blocks of the downtown of Montpelier to this day. This building would eventually be demolished, and the bank building that is on the corner of State and Main on that block would be built. But every single one of the facades that you see here, until we get to the post office, all of that is still here. Uh, the porch on this building is no longer there, but uh, the building itself is still there. So these, most of this and most of this is still part of downtown Montpelier, happily. And the date on that facing is what? 18, I'm guessing from the, the garb of the women here, that this could be as early as the 1870s. When did they put the trolley? They don't trolley look 1880s like to so me. The trolley huh? tracks are... <clears throat> the trolley tracks? Yeah, it looks like they're putting it in. Are they, is that what's going on here, Paul? Yes, 1898. 1898, okay. So this is later than, than it looks. Okay, 1898. So, so this building would go very quickly. <laughs> Because the building that stands where this was was built right around that time. Dave, can you wrap up in the yes, three minutes? I can. So, Theodore Roosevelt came to Montpelier in 1902. And here he is in his carriage, docking his top hat. He had a speech at the State House with a massive crowd on the lawn. And we're going right past the pavilion, hotel, and this is the thrush. Oh, so this is the thrush with its beautiful fan light above the federal doorway. Um, one, of the, one of the more impressive federal structures still in Montpelier, no question. And a chance to see it on one of the great days, 1902. There is the pavilion in its glory with its mansard roof and uh, cars around the 19 teens. The tavern that would take the place of the Montpelier house, uh, built in the early 1930s in a classical revival style. This aerial view that, I, that Paul sent me just today, which I thought was pretty amazing, um, gives us a chance to look at the Capitol Complex circa 1945. And here you can see <coughs> the filling station that was built, and they moved the tavern, or the, the thrush, rather, to its current location. 
Notice there's very little space between the pavilion hotel and the filling station and the thrush because the pavilion hotel was physically further over and there was no street between them the way there is today. The street instead was on this side and uh, they made the, the uh, decision when they rebuilt the facade of the Pavilion Hotel in the late 1960s that they would move the building a little closer to the Supreme Court and put the street on the opposite side. That's today Governor Dean da Governor Davis Adams. And this is a great shot of the filling station um, as it looked way back in 1945 or 1942. I think it's World, yeah, it's World War II. And um, that's the Vermont Federal Building that still stands, although the, the paint uh, was removed from the bricks at a later time. Yeah. There's another sort of shed building there behind the... Um, yes, I saw that. So there's another structure behind it, behind the filling station, and as I said, no street. Um, so they're, they're right up against the Pavilion Hotel. And yeah. I don't know if people remember the photo that, was, that we were looking at at the very beginning, but the, um, the photo of the gas station that was torn down, it was a shadow of its former self. Quite a different building. Yeah. Well, there have been lost. That little is on top of the uh, Yeah. Station. Yeah. That's Which not, is. That's not a building behind it. Exactly. Yeah. This is on the filling station. <laughs> right. So they're starting to colonialize the uh, <laughs> colonialize the filling stations around town. Um, and uh, of course, that's that's essentially the same structure that uh, was recently removed. Although it does look quite different, so I'm not sure whether there, another one was built in its place at a later time. No, that, that is it. That was covered this is in it. white tile. Okay. They removed, they removed the white tile and they put a pitched roof on it to make it more contextual yes. with the other buildings next to it. Right. And I think they did that in the early 60s, something like that. I think somebody told me that fairly recently. So. I, I'll wrap up by saying one thing. The Pavilion Hotel, that struggle to save that hotel, uh, beginning in the late 60s and ending with its demise in 1970-ish, um, was the pivotal battle that essentially turned Montpelier around from an historic preservation point of view. And I think most of us are keenly aware that while we never would have chosen to replicate the facade of that building when they rebuilt it as a 1971 office building, um, 1971 was its completion date. That is the date we look to to determine whether a building reaches that magic moment of 50 years when it suddenly can be considered an historic structure. And we're coming up on that birthday. It's soon to be regarded as an historic building itself. And a monument, I might add, to the preservation movement in Vermont. It was the turning point, essentially, and a lot of good things began to happen in Montpelier when they lost the battle to save the hotel, but somehow they managed to create a hybrid state office building that was a unique uh, opportunity and financially it was made to work by the Pizza Galley Construction Company. And we're going to have possibly have a program devoted exclusively to that soon um, as we gather more and more information from people who are still alive, like Bob Burley, the architect who was so involved in that. And I see in the, in the rear here, Muffy Conlon, 
who of course uh, uh, was married to Tom Conlon, who led the, the struggle to try to save the pavilion. Anyway, those struggles are what inform our desire to preserve Montpelier's past going forward. And I would submit we're at another critical point where a lot is going on in this vibrant town. And happily, I think many of the people in this audience must agree that historic preservation has, has played a leading role in making this community the community that it is today. And that's what we're celebrating tonight, and that's what I hope will inform us as we continue to meet the challenges of the next few years, as we have opportunities uh, to enhance the character of this truly wonderful, smallest capital city in America. Thank you. The uh, people who worked at saving the pavilion uh, going or insisted on a reconstruction is that they were really looking at the streetscape, which is we are tonight. Indeed. That's a good point. Indeed. I know that I know you want to ask David questions and have a discussion, and we're going to get to that soon. Um, now to locate Christchurch and its challenges within this context that David and Jamie so beautifully laid out is Sean Bryan, a man of many talents and our project director here at Christchurch. All right, um, back in 2010, we started to begin to assess uh, the needs of this building in a serious way. And we hired a local character, uh, Danny Duggan, to do some uh, investigative work for us back before he became a state employee. He was in private practice, and uh, he did a lot of good work for us. And so we're gonna, what you're going to see, most of what you're going to see is actually photographs from some of the work, investigative work that Jamie did for us. Um, this gives you a detail of the flash. I'm sort of going to work from the top of the bell tower down. So here's your, here's your uh, the crenellations at the top of the bell tower. That's a built-up roof. You can see the flashing is coming off the uh, stonework there. Water is infiltrating into the building through that, uh, through those gaps in the flashing. That's a built-up roof. The built-up roof has got some, some, some problems as well. It's on a concrete deck, but there are some places where that, uh, that roof is also in poor repair. The flashing obviously is in fairly poor repair, so uh, part of our project to restore this building and to get it back into a, a, a reasonable condition is to replace the flashing and that roof deck on top of the bell tower. Most of what you're going to see here tonight from me is probably something that, unless you're into stonemasonry and mortar and stuff like that, probably isn't going to be of, of a real interest to you. But it really is going to highlight what the issues are for this building in terms of restoration. Uh, you'll notice here, it, it may be a little tough to see, but there's holes and cracks in the mortar all over the space, face of the building here. What happens is when it rains, wind blows the rain into those cracks in the mortar, and then in the winter, that moisture begins to freeze, and the next thing you know, we have what we call frost jacking, which moves not only the stones, but also pops the mortar out of those joints. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a self-perpetuating problem in that it just gets worse and worse. The more water, the more the joints open up, the more water gets in, the more the water begins to frost back as we go through the freeze and thaw cycles here in, uh, in Vermont. Um, and we end up actually moving stones in the facade of the building. We also have a fair amount of deterioration in the woodwork up on the louvers of this, uh, of the bell tower. So you can see the, the, the rot in the uh, woodwork there. And again, you'll notice that there's cracks in the mortar all around there. So the water's not only, uh, the, the wood is not only rotting, but also water's getting in behind those louvers. You can see again the, the effect of that. These are uh, really deteriorating to the point where they've got to be completely replaced. 
That's, the, that's an interior view looking to the outside. Again, you can see that the louvers are just completely gone. So um, part of our restoration project, obviously, will be to completely replace all of the louvers and uh, the screening behind there, which keeps the vectors, you know, insects, pigeons, whatever, from getting into the bell tower. All of that needs to be replaced because most of it is in pretty poor condition. Again, another picture, There's, there are windows in the bell tower, uh, fairly narrow uh, windows, and I think you can see there pretty clearly there's an awful lot of wood rot around the window itself, and a pretty significant crack right here where the water is completely gone. Another crack here, another crack here where the water is getting into the stonework. Again, just the two windows that are side by side. Again, you look, here you see there's a, a the mortar is completely gone here, the mortar is completely gone here, mortar is gone here, mortar is gone here, and here. A uh, significant amount of repointing needs to be done. The solution to this is to have stonemasons come in, router out the old mortar until you get to good substrate, good mortar, and then replace it with a mortar similar to what was uh, used when the building was originally constructed. So it's a sand mortar. Um, one of the other issues that we've had with this building is at some point in the past, folks tried to repair some of these joints with cement. Well, cement is not compatible with this type of repair. You need a softer mortar. Cement, you know, Portland cement basically is a very brittle, hard substance does not work well for repair in, in a stone situation like this. This is the flashing between the roof of this building, the sanctuary, and the bell tower. You can see there's a, uh, lots of slate pieces that have come down through here. Um, you know, major gaps in the flashing here, holes, pinholes in this flashing all the way along. So what you've got is water coming in through the flashing uh, into the bell tower. And water is just not a good thing when it's inside your building, whether it's your house or your church. Again, uh, just another shot of the flashing. You can see all of the broken pieces of slate. As the slate has, you know, as pieces of slate have come off the roof, they've slid down and literally punctured uh, holes through the flashing. This is actually the cap to the sanctuary roof up here butting up against the bell tower. And you can see again that there's a huge hole right here, gaps where the water is just pouring into the bell tower. And if we go up back in the back corner, you can look in this back corner, the plasters come off the, uh, the wall and the ceiling. We've got mold issues in that area. So all of that is part of our restoration uh, plan. Again, you can see that large chunk of mortar that's just been popped out. And obviously the water uh, continues to infiltrate through there. These are capstones. And where you've got capstones on the top, you've got this, this entire section that's wide open where the mortar has, has uh, again, has been spalled out. And water just pours in through those cracks. Uh, again, the joints here, these joints, and this joint all the way through here as the mortar's completely gone. Again, same thing there, you can see this, as I, as I said, this is probably not of a lot of interest to some of you, but you know, if you're really into stone and mortar, uh, you can see there's uh, pretty significant gaps in that area. This is the top of the rose window up here. If you look up there, there's your rose window. This is the outside. You can see there's a big gap in the mortar at the top of the rose window. There are gaps all the way along here. There's another gap here. Those gaps go all the way around. You can also see the woodwork around that window that holds the, the window itself in place is uh, rapidly deteriorating. Uh, our goal will be to uh, 
hopefully restore that wood. If it isn't so far gone, we have to pull that entire window up. Um, our, our goal is to be able to inject that with epoxy and then repaint it and uh, restore it. Um, we also hope to be able to pull this plexiglass that was put on at some point. Um, there were never any weep holes when they put the plexiglass over the, over the window. And so it's trapped moisture in behind the plexiglass. And obviously moisture trapped against the wood and glass is a pretty, uh, a pretty significant recipe for a disaster in the future. When we replace the, the uh, plexiglass on what we call the Jesus window, which is the big window up behind our altar, uh, several years ago, we discovered that, that literally that window was ready to fall into the church because the wood was so far gone. Um, we were able to, again, we were able to restore that wood and save the window, but it, it, it would have been nip and tuck over the years if, if that, and obviously that would have been a catastrophic failure for us. That's a, it's a beautiful window and irreplaceable. And again, you can see the cracks alongside the window there in the mortar, uh, which let them, again, letting the water into the... This is on the north side of the building, so this is the wall on this side of the rose window. This whole wall, you can see the cracks, it just, the mortar is falling out in all of these locations all the way down through. Again, we're fortunate the wind doesn't tend to come from that direction, so we don't get quite as much water in that area, but. It's, it's still work that needs to be uh, done to replace that. Here's a really good example of just how bad this gets. This, this entire section of stone has been frost jacked in this direction. You can see the gap is quite wide here and right here. So these, these stones literally are gonna have to be reset. So when the masons come in to work on this, those stones will have to be pulled out, and then reset. That's a great photograph. Just a very obvious example of a, what happens with what we call the frost jacking. You can see the whole, uh, the mortar's completely gone. That goes back in about four inches. So the mortar that used to be there is completely gone, been completely eroded away by uh, the action of the frost and free, the freeze and thaw cycle. What happens when you get water into a building? Now we're in the foundation. This is the, one of the main beams that you're sitting on right now. That holds the floor. Are, we, are we okay? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, and you can see the beam is set into the foundation wall, typical construction. Okay, so that you you know you see whether it's floor joists or whether it's beams, they're set into the wall, uh, and then floor joists come off that to the sides. Well, this is so rotted that we've actually had to install, and you can't see it here, but we put in some uh, supplemental posts quite a bit further back because that literally was dropping uh, when, when weight was applied to it, i.e. when we had a full congregation in here. Um, and again, you can see the effects of the, the water on the interior of the building there, completely rotting away that main beam. And also the floor joists. So these are the floor joists that come off that main beam. And you can see along the wall that the, the ends of those floor joists are completely rotted away. And we've had to do some temporary shoring up of those floor joists to keep the floor from dropping uh, as it uh, takes a very load. Back some time ago, we, when we were doing some work on the, on the roof, we put a temporary membrane. This is a, a, just a rubber membrane over a portion of the roof until the flashing could be repaired between the sanctuary and the bell tower. Um, that was supposed to be a two, three, four year repair. It's been there for ten, almost 10 years now. So uh, well overdue for replacement. And, uh, Someday when you're wandering around outside and the weather's a little nicer and it's a sunny day, if you look up at the rose window and you look at about this four o'clock location and you stand 
close to the building and look up, you will see that there's a significant bulge in this location um, where the stones have been cross-stacked away from the interior rubble wall of the church. Those stones will all have to be pulled out and again reset. Um, but you can see there's significant gaps here, 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 here. So again, the water is getting in behind and jacking those, or frost jacking those stones out. So part of our repair would be where we have those kinds of situations would be to actually have to pull those stones out and reset them. Now the challenge with that, and I'll just very briefly go over this, but the challenge with that is notice that these stones are all different sizes and shapes. They're not, you know, they're not all four by fours or six by sixes or eight by eights or whatever you, want, whatever you would like to think. So every one of those stones that has to come out has to be cataloged in place and then replaced in exactly the same location or it's not going to work. It's a, it's a puzzle. And one of the challenges is when you pull these out is you also have to make sure that your mortar joints are identical to the joints that were there before or otherwise the stones won't fit. So it's truly uh, work for someone who is really skilled in this kind of restoration work. And that is my story. Well, I don't like to tackle campaign people much. Less people to be that, but I, we, we, we have been on a capital campaign, and we've invited the community through a number of uh, channels to uh, participate in that to the extent that folks would like to. Um, we've estimated that the total cost of the rehabilitation that we need to do on the building between talking with our engineers and architects is probably a million and a half dollars. Um, the uh, capital campaign has raised in the vicinity from within our congregation alone about, I think, a half million? No, six, over 600. And, and with the participation of folks from outside, about $600,000 towards that uh, total restoration goal. I think the, the, the goal of the campaign was to raise 700 because we just felt that it wasn't going to be possible for us to raise a million and a half all in one go. Um, so, you know, we're, we've been thrilled, I think is the word to use, uh, with the outpouring of support from within our congregation and also uh, from within the community. We've had some very significant contributions from folks in the community for which we're very, very thankful. Um, I don't know. Yes, sir. And is there a possibility you guys could apply for like a historic preservation grant? Have you explored that? We've, we've got a historic preservation yeah, grant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's uh, it's twenty thousand um, dollars, so it helps, yeah. but it doesn't pay the bills. Gotcha. <laughs> and um, Sharon is running the campaign. And why don't you join us up front? And we'll allow. Yeah. Anybody has any specific questions about the campaign? Thank you, Sean. I, I think I stepped on your. Again, eager to get to discussion, I do want to acknowledge Steve Everett, this uh, an area business person and property owner, and he's just going to do a brief update on the Montpelier Heritage Group. The Montpelier Heritage Group is an independent nonprofit that was created over 40 years ago in the 70s. I can speak a little louder if that's better. Just put it pointed at your mouth. Okay. Is that better? Right up to your mouth. Close. Oh, okay. Is that better? Okay. Again, the Montpelier Heritage Group is an independent nonprofit organization that was formed over 40 years ago by a number of interested citizens in Montpelier. And their goal was to generate interest in local history and concern for the preservation of Montpelier as a unique place to live and work. Uh, through a number of activities. Uh, the, they have uh, lobbied the local government and have encouraged independent uh, renovation by property owners. They've sponsored programs and brought in nationally recognized speakers and they had the, as a lot of people know, they had the uh, ice cream social on the State House lawn with a croquet tournament in the summer in conjunction with the band concert. 
And again, they put on a number of programs, slideshows, presentations, to help people who were interested in renovating their own properties, and again, lobbying on bank for local, other local organizations uh, to again encourage people to save the, the best part of my pillar, its historical downtown and related neighborhoods. Does anybody have any questions? The, the original group, of course, one of the, uh, the most active members was Margot George. Uh, Anthony Otis was a member. Uh, since they are no longer, Margaret passed away a few years ago, and Anthony's no longer participating in the organization. So the organization has been dormant for a few years, but there's a lot of interest in reactivating it. Uh, I know that Sandy Fitzthum, uh, John Russell, Leslie Bomberg, and myself uh, would be interested in trying to get, get it going again and being more active in the community and again with, with its focus on its original goals. Any questions you might have to the panelists? And also, um, let's hear any of your own pers perspectives and comments. I thought Jamie uh, posed a really good question, which is, you know, what are the characteristics of State Street that we value, and uh, what would we like to see in the future? Questions, comments? Yes? So uh, thank you for introducing yourself. Uh, I just had a question. When the buildings were torn down over the years, possibly how old were the buildings? Um, were they 100 years old? Were they in the yeah. last 100 years? Um, well, I mean, you know, the post office was not even that. It would have been around 70 years old when it went down. The Pavilion Hotel was um, at the point at which it was uh, taken down in the late 60s. Again, it was only 70, 80 years old at that point. So many times it isn't necessarily the age of the building that is contributing to its demise, as just simply changes in use. Changes in use and changes in um, what people value. And I'm sorry to say that both of those buildings met their demise simply because at that time the general population of Montpelier was not as aware of the need to save some of its more important structures. That started to change, as I said, with the Pavilion Hotel. And I think the 70s was a decade when increasing awareness about preservation began to keep, gain steam. Thank you. How about from this side? Uh, question? Well, kind of the same question, which is, who can we blame for the demise of the post office? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Was it the same at all? To me, it's the federal government. I mean, it was a federal building, and the federal government wanted a more efficient building, a more modern building. I mean, you have to look at, yeah. when you go in every day, you walk by the, uh, the attributes and the, the people who are uh, in the, So that is a federal government project. And how about from this side? We'll just alternate. Questions, comments? I wanted to say that um, while the federal government may have been responsible for the post office, the government, especially the state, along with the business community, have been, uh, should be credited with, with building and saving some of our most notable buildings. Yeah. Eric? Make a, a comment. In 1976, the state got a grant federal grant from the uh, Economic Development Administration to spruce up and preserve buildings on a bicentennial rail route that was never built. But there are a number of buildings in Montpelier that benefited from that. The uh, uh, railroad station across from Shaw's, uh, the uh, building that used to have a cheese grater on the front, the road shop, all were that key. 
EDA bicentennial grant projects. Thank you. Maybe they're trying to redeem themselves. <laughs> yes, introduce yourself, please. Uh, Jerry Castellano, I'm a citizen of Montpelier and interested in historic preservation. I'm just, there's obviously we've had a number of changes in zoning recently. Uh, there's a lot of uh, renovations going on over the French block. Well, I, just a general question to the panel what do you see as some of the challenges facing us to preserve the historic downtown, and especially along some parts of State Street, as there's the pressure to develop? Um, that's just my question. I think I'm going to toss this one to JB first. May I? Sure. All right. And also, if you'd remind people how they can participate as citizens in some of these decisions that are coming up. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would say the two uh, challenges in particular that I would see are accessibility and making historic buildings accessible. Yeah. There you uh, go. Um, to the extent possible. Um, and also the some of the issues around flooding and how that impacts um, new infill development within uh, just uh, floor levels and, and certain other uh, aspects that um, can make integrating new construction into our historic built environment uh, challenging because it was built at a different time with different standards and codes and as that changes. But um, but it is possible. It just requires. Um, some careful consideration. And uh, so uh, there are a number of um, ways people can get involved in helping to direct that. One would be to get involved a little bit in the, uh, in the zoning uh, revision and uh, some of the components of that, uh, looking at the design review process as we've been doing at the Historic Preservation Commission. I know uh, Kevin's over there. He may want to uh, mention about uh, an upcoming grant that's going to look at some streetscape improvements and uh, some other good things that are happening around here to help uh, with that. Well, if you want to, maybe. Kevin, yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Kevin Casey, Department of Planning and Community Development. We just received a grant, a municipal planning grant from the state. No, oh, sure. <laughs> well, we just received a municipal planning grant from the state uh, to do a state street, uh, state street streetscape master plan. Um, so we just received that last month. Uh, we'll be putting out an RFQ for uh, consultants. So we'll be looking for landscape architects and designers to, to help with that process. So we anticipate that's going to be kicked off in the next six months, I'd say. Um, and you know we're looking to do things and to get some of the images that we saw and if, if you can look we did a, an EPA grant a few years ago it was the Greening America's Capitals um, so it'll be something along those lines where we'll start to see some images we'll start to see some um, uh, designs for for what we wanted to look like incorporating the um, the recent uh, wayfinding uh, plan that was done by Montpelier Live um, and so we're going to actually really need a lot of public input. That's going to be one of the critical pieces of this, is making sure that there's um, plenty of input. And there are enough people here to have actually have a significant impact. So when we put it out, I'll make sure that it gets out to this group and make sure that there's a. I was just thinking we should start a sign up sheet. Yeah, and that's a great idea. Like right? you, um, so that people can yeah. get some more information. I'm not going to start that. Somebody to draw the right squares and stop. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, did somebody else want to address the yeah. question about challenges and solutions? Yeah. I, I think we're, we're in a period where it's it's tricky to know what the challenges are uh, because we're no longer in a period like the 1950s and 60s where progress meant you demolished buildings and moved on to the next, you know, great thing, like the federal building that they built back then. Um, we're in a period where everybody kind of agrees that historic preservation is a good thing, but what I think has often happened in the projects that I've been involved in, and I imagine some of my colleagues as well, is that a real preservationist is somebody who cares even when there is something in tension with preservation. 
that will change it, and you just give in to that tension um, and allow the other good thing to prevail at the expense of the preservation of that resource. And what I mean by that is something, for example, like energy efficiency and how we're losing incrementally the elements that characterize our historic buildings because we think we're doing the right thing by replacing all the windows right then and there. Instead of doing the hard work of determining how to make your house energy efficient in a less aggressive manner. And that takes education, that takes enough caring to go to the great trouble of figuring out problems. Um, we have a lot of problems, and they're not easy to solve, and it's where they become a real problem that is going to require some major work. That we're, that's where a lot of our preservation battles are being lost. Me by the, the slow increment of change yeah. without and thinking about the, the easy whole thing. Doing yeah. the easy <laughs> thing, or what you think is the easy thing. Paul, oh. you should introduce yourself. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Spartahan. I'm resident of Montpelier and librarian for the Historical Society. Um, I was, uh, since we got, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just since we've got a lot of representatives from the church here, I was wondering if maybe um, you could update the community on your plans, uh, not just for the renovation of this building, but for the further development of this lot, um, and also the uh, potential demolition of the, um, the parish house, and what sort of uh, discussions you've been going through in your community about um, either reusing the parish house or demolishing it for a new building, and what that new structure might look like. I think that's at least a two-part uh, answer. I think it's a one. A one? We can start with, maybe start with Steve. No, Sean. Sean, you want to talk about that? Sure. So. Um, we've, we're three years into a process of looking at um, the possibility of doing a portable housing project, uh, and that would include the replacement of the parish house with a housing project of some sort. Um, I can't, we, we don't have any designs at this point. Um, obviously, we're impacted by everything that's going on around us, so until some of that has settled and we have the opportunity to assess what those impacts will be on our ability to construct something, uh, we really, I, I actually asked the architect, do we have anything at this point that would be useful or helpful for this meeting tonight? We really don't. Uh, we would like to think that, the, that we can come up with a design working with architects that would be, it'll be different from what you see today, obviously, because what we have today, frankly, uh, was built about 50 years ago and was built on the cheap and has some significant structural deficiencies that um, really make it uninhabitable for any kind of housing project or anything other than what we're using it for today. So, and it's also, frankly, uh, an energy hop um, it, it, it is uh, going to bankrupt us if we don't do something with us, to be perfectly candid. So, you know, our goal would be to create a housing project that would meet the, the needs of some of our uh, relatives here in the city, create an opportunity for people to have a, a space that they can come into that's safe and uh, energy efficient and sound and handicapped accessible, which is a challenge for us at this point. So you know, we're a long way from having designs, we're a long way from having plans, um, but our, our goal and part of our mission in outreach to our community is to hopefully create a housing project that would create spaces for folks um, that uh, need housing here in Montpelier. We certainly know that the housing needs in Montpelier are not getting much better at this point. I, this, I, that's and probably the best I can do for you at this point. Fair to say that the church is very open to input and to uh, review by. Well, we would have to go through. We have to go through. Yeah, we have to go through the whole process.
process just yeah. like everybody else. So I'm sure folks will have the opportunity to participate uh, through that process if, they, if they're inclined to do so. I'm, I'm not on the panel, but may I just Please. make a comment? <laughs> um, Introduce yourself. My name is Linda Prescott. I'm a member of Christ Church and um, a member of the capital campaign effort. Uh, I just want to clarify something. Uh, the capital campaign and the restoration project, which Sean talked to us about earlier, um, is um, it addresses itself to the sanctuary, the, the part of the church that you're sitting in right now. This is the historic part of Christ Church. This is the historic structure. When Sean was talking about the parish hall where we potentially might be having affordable housing, that is not a part of the restoration project. Um, just to make that really clear, I don't know if people understood that or not, but. Okay. No, but thank you. Yeah. And I would be remiss in not reminding uh, repeating that um, the goal was 700,000 we're at 600,000 so we're getting there and uh, we'll address with lots of um, more help from the community we'll address those needs that that John described other comments questions yes I'm Jenny Catone I'm uh resident of Montpelier. I worked for many, many years in the State House, and I'm also an active member of Christ Church. My question has nothing to do with Christ Church specifically, though. Um, I've been concerned, and I'm not going to express any opinions about the, the possibility or likelihood of construction around us of uh, some, some new edifices. Uh, but one thing that's concerned me since the very beginning of the talks about these is that I haven't heard anything about an initiative or the relationship of an initiative of two or three years ago, the um, Net Zero 2030 initiative. And I know it was not a state, or I mean a, a city undertaking per se, but a lot of us in the city went and looked at all the design submissions from actually all over the world. We had a long meeting at the pavilion that a lot of us attended. It was very well attended. We voted on one that happened to be the one I voted on. It was not high in the sky or unrealistic. It was a really wonderful submission about what Montpelier could look like by 2030 in terms of energy sustainability. I haven't heard one word about that when I've heard the discussions going on about the bill in Montpelier. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Can somebody address the relationship between the proposed changes in Montpelier and that project, that envisioning project, Elizabeth? Were you part of that? Yes. Yeah. Excuse me? Two Elizabeths. All right. Would one of you like to address this? Parker? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Parker, and I'm, uh, uh, I work with the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, which came out of uh, Net Zero Vermont. Uh, Deb's here, and uh, Deb and Dan. Uh, birth this amazing design competition, which I'm sure many of you have seen the, um, the drawings of. And the, as Jenny said, the thing about that was it was an independent effort, and um, it was not uh, it was not something that has yet to be, well, I guess I could say it's yet to be adopted by the city as a vision for what Montpelier might be. And um, one of the things that we continue to be very aware of is the fact that 65% of Montpelier is now dedicated to parking and that there is a potential for a change in land use uh, and we believe that parking problem is a transportation problem. So we've been working uh, towards that end. And I think that um, 
it's hard because we, we had all these wonderful visions, and now our job as a community is how do we realize those visions. So I just want to let you know that we're, it, you know, at the Sustainable Montpelier is here on the ground working on those issues. Um, the other Elizabeth, Elizabeth Courtney, who's sitting in the back, with uh, Tina O'Brien, the chair of Sustainable Montpelier, has done, we have uh, mobilized a group of uh, roundtable to talk about what we're calling the Lower North Branch neighborhood, which is from State Street to um, the Winooski and from Main Street to Taylor Street because of the French block and the development over the transit center and potentially the um, development here um, on the Christchurch property. There may be as many as 150 new residents in this neighborhood. So how do we make, the, how do we have adequate open space, how do we make a backyard for all of those people so that they can really have a place to live and improve the quality of their life here in downtown Montpelier. So they're, I'm outlining, you know, transportation, open space, housing. Um, in, in, there are, are many in, issues that come together, and um, and I think that we as a community need to continue the conversation of historic preservation and how historic preservation is brought forward into you know our living future and and energy efficiency, obviously, all these different things together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Elizabeth. Kevin, I think you wanted to address this yeah, just, relationship too. And, sure, yeah. sure. So just to, just to follow up on that, um, Ginny's original question. Um, earlier this fall, we applied for a $250,000 FTA Transit Oriented Design Planning Grant. FTA is? FTA is Federal Transit Administration. Um, we anticipate we'll find out any time in the next few months um, I've been emailing them, but apparently they're closed. Uh, so, and one of the issues is not essential, huh? Yeah, exactly, not essential. Um, so, I think that actually one of the one of the issues that we're intrigued by about that was to say, not necessarily let's do this, but let's what's the feasibility? Because again and again, the issue comes up, and people will say we'll throw around huge numbers, you know, ten million, twenty, forty, one hundred and fifty million dollars for you know, to do something with the rail. We don't know, but the important thing is, is to find out. And that's what the goal of this was. It may come back and say it's just not feasible, but at least we do the study. At least we find out. And that's, that's the, the, the point behind this planning grant, was to answer some of those questions. You know, what is it gonna cost to do the rail sidings? What's it gonna cost to, to make some of these changes, to do remote parking, to do environmental cleanup, all of these issues, and so, um, Hopefully we get it. If we don't, we can apply for it again next year. It's a, it's a, it's a great program. Um, but just to, to, to follow up that, you know, it is an intriguing idea, but like anything, we want to do the planning first. So we'll find out what the answers are and then decide if it's feasible. And if it's feasible, then we go to the next step. But we're not going to go there until it's, it's a lot of money, too. So we have to find out if we get the grant because we can't do it on that. Okay. Thank, thank you, Kevin, and I, I, I think we all heard the invitation from Elizabeth that another opportunity for citizen input and participation is through Sustainable Montpelier. I just want to say we are planning on having a, a public forum probably in March uh, in which we're going to gather people together again and, and uh, talk and discuss it more. Right. And, and so that would be another good use of the list that's circulating if people would like to know about a public forum on, on how you're addressing some of these uh, development and preservation issues. Sandy, Sandy. Am I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> yes, of course you are. First, I hold the to mic make right a up to your short lunch. announcement, which is that the Heritage Group is actively trying to gain new members. There's no membership charge, and there are little brochure pamphlets over there by the uh, refreshments that if you take them, you can take it home and just call or email me. I'm acting as secretary right now. Okay, so here's the thing. Historic preservation was actually radical in the late 60s and early 70s. And I think I'm in this group, but I noticed that most of us are over the age of 35 in this room. <laughs> and probably most of us remember 
the early 70s that are in this room. And my question to the audience and to the rest of the group is how do we make historic preservation fresh, alive? And I am concerned in the other issues that we have that are grave issues, accessibility, um, energy efficiency, flooding, that historic preservation gets counted in as some fossil-like thing, like, oh yes, and we have to do this. I'd rather that it be an energetic, live, uh, for me, I've always worked with old buildings, and for me, old buildings are alive. It would be so sad to lose that. I don't know how, though, to engage people that are under the age of 40 after the test. Right. I don't mean to be ageist, but if somebody is under the age of 40 who would like to address this, how to keep it fresh. Do you want to say something? I'm 43, but yeah. Oh, I don't know. Briefly, <laughs> please. <laughs> Because we're getting to the I, I got interested in buildings in Montpelier when I was about 14 or 15, and I started roaming around and looking at things. I think in this day and age, maybe one way though is maybe even more so now is through like visual interest. Since people are so interested in taking photographs, I guess that's what I hear about what people do online, and there are really things that are geometrically really stunning about buildings. That might be one. Thing. Another thing for me was sort of like almost a scavenger hunt kind of like detective aha thing. One thing in particular, I got interested in Shakespeare because we had books around and I was interested in the poetry and the romance of it when I was like 13. And then we went to Buffalo High School and we had plays. One of the plays that we listened to or read was um, a, merchant, a Merchant of Venice. And, and I paid attention to the dialogue. I was walking around downtown, and I was like, oh, near the river, there's this building called the Rialto Block. There's a Rialto mentioned in that play. Wow, oh, people might have been inspired. There were people from Italy that immigrated to this area. Oh my gosh. So I got really interested. Later, I was in a scenic design class, and I copied a painting of, of um, the Rialto Bridge in Italy. So that's just like an example of like scavenger hunt type of mentality. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else want to address it? It sounds like you're telling us to go on Instagram. I don't know. I don't do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you don't have to qualify. What? <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things, I think the goals, I've been in the present reformation movement for about 45 years now. In 1966, which is the date of the major preservation legislation, a couple years before that, there was a book that came out called The Presence of the Past. Yes. And it really set forth, uh, that was in the middle of urban renewal when people were just demolishing everything, uh, nothing old was good. Uh, but I think one of the goals for the preservation movement uh, over the years has been not to you know, make it a radical movement, but to integrate it with the programs that were around. And I uh, am sending you know, the National Park Service has its, has its preservation program with grants and all of that. The state has a division for historic preservation. A lot of that has occurred. And uh, to, to answer the question a little bit, I think that what you're talking about, what the Heritage Group is talking about, we have to keep people aware of the treasure we have. And you can do that with presentations, you can do it with lectures, you can do it with walking tours, and how critical it is to the, to the success of Montpelier to uh, have the downtown we have in the buildings and neighborhoods. I gotta tell a real quick story. I had a meeting here, it's the first meeting that the hotel opened and Fred hosted uh, the State of Star Preservation Officers from all over the country. And they were simply blown away by Montpelier. Now this is, this is, these are experts in preservation, experts in downtown, familiar with them, and they, they could not believe how walkable and pleasant Montpelier and its joining neighborhoods were. 
and I think we need to reflect on that. You know, keep educating people and telling people that hey, this is really neat. These are neat buildings, and you know, there's a lot of technology around today that you know, solves some of the energy problems and solves some of the handicap access problems that before were mitigating against the use of the historic buildings. Thank you, David. Do you want to have a last I, I think uh, Sammy's put her finger on the biggest dilemma that we all face, and it's what I, what I referred to earlier, which is that it's, we don't have people out there with wrecking balls anymore who are poised to demolish our treasures in the way that the pavilion and the post office and the train station all were demolished during a time like that. We have a much more challenging time, which is that what Eric spoke of is the integration of historic preservation with all these other virtues that we're pursuing. Energy efficiency, sustainability, how do we keep multi-generations living together in the community and uh, being able to, uh, to support all of this we have got a treasure here. Nobody in this room uh, would call Montpelier anything less. It is a treasure itself. And happily, we have a huge number of historic buildings. The hard part is always reminding ourselves that they don't stay historic or in good health without constant attention and detail and worrying about them all the time. We can never forget to worry about them. You can imagine what I put up with day in, day out, in as vibrant and active an environment as the stadiums. Everyone acknowledges it is a treasure, it is a gem, it must be preserved. But then I sit down with a bunch of people who want to change it. And they want to change it for good things. They want to change it because it's a 21st century active state house. And that's what makes it unique. It has the oldest legislative chambers in the United States that are in their original condition and still actively used for the exact same purpose that they were created for. That's what makes them truly unique. Not their age, but the fact that we're still using them. And there are so many buildings like that throughout Vermont, particularly here in this littlest of state capitals. And the small scale gives us the opportunity to grapple with the complex issues of our time with all of that integration that Eric was talking about and trying to figure out how we keep historic preservation first and foremost among the virtues that we're working for. That's the struggle. Thank you, David. Um, did I hear applause? <laughs> Uh, I think there were, yes, it was such a good final word, but it had stimulated a couple more comments. If you have to leave, please feel free to, uh, but I will take a couple more comments and questions uh, here, and then Diane back there. Say hi to you. Hi, my name is Tony Hartridge. Just hold it right up to you. Yeah, right up to you. Yeah. Uh, I live on Terrace Street. I moved here from Stanner, so, but I, I adore it at the State House. And what's most important, what David is saying, one of the vitalities, and I can tell you from all my tours, is everybody marvels at this town. They marvel at that state house. They want, they, they walk through this, they can't believe what they have. And it has to help us somewhat, because that tourism is very important to our shops, to our restaurants, to everything else. And downtown is really important, and the state house good reminder of the economic vitality of historic preservation. Uh, my name is Jenny Derby. I've lived and worked in my career just about exactly half my life, 30 years ago. Um, and I've seen great things happen in this town. I really
really feel like it's a great community here. I think I was one of those very excited by the, the Net Zero 2030 contest. And I thought it really brought a lot of energy to town. I was in that pavilion when we made the decision, voted on it, and it was really interesting. And I don't think it's an either or. I don't think it's either preservation or net zero. I think the key to develop to working on the future of Montpelier is to, to bring all of these ideas together to maintain the preservation and move forward with net zero and develop that riverfront the way we talked about with net zero, which was so exciting for so many people. And I just uh, personal aside, I have a house up on College Street that I have for 20 years. Lovely old house. I actually was awarded a Montpelier Heritage Grant Award back when Margo was still around, um, much to my surprise. I had to leave that house this year and sell it. I moved to the opposite side of town. I live in a 1,300 square foot ranch. Total change of pace. And I never knew there was that side of town. I never knew there was that community. Surrounded by young families with two kids who are all too busy to come out here tonight because they've all got two or three young kids under the age of six. But they're the future of Montpelier. They're not here tonight. And I think what's really key is to energize people under that 35 age range. And I'm totally game for trying to figure out how we do that and knocking on my neighbors' doors. They don't have the kind of you know, we all live in ranch and colonial houses built in the 60s over there, and it's such a different feel from what I knew up on College Street. But I just don't think it has to be an either or, and I think the future of this town is really going to be about bringing in young people to have these discussions. And, you know, it's really, you know, exciting to see some of the new projects. Kevin and I was just thinking today, watching the transit center go up. I worked for Jim Jeffers in 2003 when that federal grant was awarded. <laughs> so there, there are changes happening, some good and some that people aren't so happy about, but it's, um, it's great to see these conversations going. So thank you, and, and whatever I can do to help bring along the next generation who all live in my neighborhood. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, everybody. I'm going to invite you to continue the conversation over some refreshments and let those who need to get back to their families Go and uh, thank all of our speakers and commentators.